Okay, hey, this is Stefan Kinsella with a different edition of Kinsella on Liberty. Um, one of my internet acquaintances, Nick Sennard, is that the right pronunciation? Uh, yes. Is joining us. Um, you wanted to chat about something today. I forgot what it was. <laughs> I did yeah. two Tom Woods episodes last week and I'm, things are blending together, so I'm forgetting what we were going to talk about, but uh, I'll let you bring bring up whatever you want. Go ahead. All right, well, I, All right, introduce yourself too, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm just uh, Nick Sennard, been a libertarian for like eight years. You know, um, I got a few businesses and stuff, but uh, I mean, I got a site, nicksonard.com. You know, I put some libertarian stuff up on there, but it's been a while since I've updated it. I, for some reason, thought you were an, uh, a foreigner, an outs a Frenchman or something with that name, but you sound Southern to me. Yeah, it's, it is French, but yeah. <laughs> What state are you in or from? Uh, Tennessee. Tennessee. Okay. Yeah, close to Great Smoky Mountains. All right. But well, um, two Southerners on the line, then let's try to keep the IQ level, the total IQ level above 100 if we can. It will be a challenge. I know. But no, I guess I want to talk about mostly three things. I think they're all pretty interrelated. Is one that's um, one you're starting to see more is that libertarians starting to act like or say, that Facebook's a part of the state. You oh, know, yeah. Start, start right. See that more. Yeah. And, um, no one, I think that's related is kind of the section uh, 230 yeah. thing. Or even libertarians will bring that up. And then I've seen, it's not as popular as it used to be, but um, terms of service violations as aggression, you know, uh, I've seen a few libertarians make that, but I think that's just confusion on liability and contract theory. Yeah, I haven't heard that one too much. Um I don't recall ever hearing, hearing that terms of service or an aggression. Um, you could argue that they're not a binding contract, and I think there are good arguments for that. Right. Well, I'm just saying, um, on that one, I've seen people say, well, you know, Facebook or Twitter didn't follow their own terms of service, so someone has the right to force them to do Oh, right. Yeah that's, a, yeah, that's a confusion of, of libertarian property and contract theory. That's true. Yeah. But I guess start with the, um, the first one, which is the most popular one I've seen talked on a few shows, actually, and many people in, say, the Mises Caucus group. Um, pretty much Facebook is a part of the state just because they're cooperating with the state when it comes to what information the government wants on its platform, you know, and they're like, right well, now it's a part of the state. Therefore, you know, I've seen some say that, no, I don't want legislation uh, or anything like that, but you can say you don't want legislation to affect Facebook, but if you're saying Facebook's a part of the state, that does enter into some dangerous grounds. Yeah, you know, I agree. I mean, I think if you conclude someone is, you should say it. You shouldn't be afraid of the consequences, but you should be ca cautious and try to do it carefully. Um, I guess I've been thinking about this too. Um, why do we? Why do people feel compelled to do this? Like, why are there this witch hunt to classify Google, et cetera, as part of the state? Or corporations like the left libertarians want to say that about corporations because they have this limited liability privilege grant, so called. Um, I mean, I think as first as libertarians, important to to understand the state because it's the biggest aggressor. Um, so we have an analysis and theory of the state. Um, so the state is an identifiable actor, or agent, or entity in society, and it plays a certain role. It's the institutionalized source of aggression. <clears throat> now, we libertarians oppose aggression in general, so we oppose what I would say is private aggression and public aggression or aggression by private criminals, which is why we need self-defense and defense agencies and laws and courts and things like that. And we also oppose institutionalized aggression, and it seems clear that institutionalized aggression by the state is a far bigger threat than random, isolated, ad hoc acts of private crime by private criminals. Um, and the minarchists… And classical liberals recognize the danger of public aggression, which is why they they want to create a state, but they want to put limits on it, like in a constitution. So, like they recognize how dangerous it is, so they want to put limits on it. But they basically recognize the state is a is a is a possible source of violation of rights. So we have to identify the state, and we have an analysis of the state. Um, I think that analysis always comes with like this class analysis, like Hoppe does, and even Marx does to some extent, but he does it in a different way. But um, it's basically 
the rule of the majority by a minority, right? That's why they do it. So that it's like a pyramid of power. So that you know the five percent or the two percent or the or the one percent or even the ten percent can exploit the other ninety percent or ninety nine percent, right? So they can live high on the hog while the masses are relatively impoverished. Um, so to succeed, I think Hoppe goes into this in his Banking Nation States great article. Um, they have to basically persuade the population to go along with it by a variety of, of techniques, propaganda, coercion, tradition, appeals to authority, and, and with democracy by getting everyone to f- falsely believe that they're part of the state. Um, and you know, they so many people have relatives or they themselves work for the state because the government is so large now. The federal government, for example. So everyone is, you know, their kids are going to public schools and we drive on public roads. So everyone starts to have this kind of interest in the state. So they're reluctant to challenge it. But still, the state itself has to be a minority. So if you broaden the definition of what's the state so so large that it includes Google and Facebook. And even broader, any corporation, because no one has totally clean hands, I suppose. And even broader than that, every not only every human being that's an employee of the state, which is, I don't know, what, 20, 15, 20, 30 percent of the population, but people that are being paid by the state. Because what's the difference economically and politically, whether you pay someone a salary or you have a defense contractor that you're paying, right, or a welfare recipient who's getting money, Um or private jails, you know. So I guess these are all part of the state. So you, if you're going to have such a loose standard of uh, conceptual connection or causation that Google and Facebook are part of the state, then basically we're all part of the state, which is exactly the lie that the state tells. They tell us this. Oh, you are part of the government. That's why you can't complain about it. You know, you have to. You have the right to vote. So you are the government, right? So you can't complain if you don't get the results you don't like. So. You have these anti-status, so-called, doing the same thing that the status do. They're all saying we're all part of the state, which is ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Um, so – but then you have to ask, okay, so why are these libertarians – why do they want to say that Facebook and Twitter and Google and YouTube uh, – who else? Uh, Amazon? I don't know if Amazon, Amazon counts. Apple? Um, basically the Fang and I guess other companies – why are they part of the state? I mean, the older reason from 10, 20 years ago would be, you know, they're corporations, they have limited liability, or they they influence policy, or they have lobbyists on in DC. Mm-hmm. Um, they're in bed with the state, they'll say. I mean, the, the chain of causation is not always clear, admittedly. It's not clear whether the state has wormed its way into corporate America and business so that we have a type of fascism where you have nominal private ownership, but government is so intertwined that they influence what the government does, what business does, or where the business influences what the state does, and they're they're at the control of the corporate power, which is sort of what the crony capitalists think. Um, I think it's a mixture, yeah. but I mean, if you're going to say whoever influences the state is part of the state or responsible for it, what about the voters? You know, yeah. what about the average voter? What about people who write articles that? Propose progressive programs, taxation and public schools and war and all that. Um, so this ultimately requires a careful and nuanced and cautious application of causation analysis, which is what I try to do in one of my articles with Pat Tinsley on causation and aggression in the QJAE years ago. Um, but it's not just something you can do from your armchair or blustering. What I think is going on, and I'll let you jump in in a second, but what I think is really going on is – a lot of libertarians are impatient. This is why they're activist types. They, they don't want to just think and have intellectual ideas and work for freedom in their own life. They want freedom now for everyone, god damn it. And, um, and then some of them tend to join the Libertarian Party, and because they don't make much progress by advocating anarchy or radical minarchy, you know, they tend to compromise or settle for tiny improvements or even the tiny hope of a tiny improvement. Uh, so they go you know, file a suit for the Supreme Court or they'll field a local candidate for office and you know, argue for school choice and things like that. Some of them compromise and sell out or they refuse to push for radical things and only tiny little things. So they're desperate for some little win, um, basically because they're kind of either libertines or they're lifestyle libertarians or they're just impatient. Um, and they 
tend to be the type that also are non-conformist and contrarians in the, the regular ways people live their lives. They don't like having a boss. They don't like having to obey rules. They're basically not just against political authority and unjust political authority, but they're against all legal authority and all hierarchies in society, which is sort of the left libertarian problem, right? They oppose mm-hmm. not just um, uh, the state and aggression, but they oppose bossing people around or in private hierarchies. I think the natural approach is something Jeff Dice mentioned recently, which is where Hoppe gets at. You can have either private authority and hierarchy, or you can have public hierarchy and authority. You got to choose. You can't have none. If you have none, you have literally chaos and no society. Um, So the libertarian approach is really what you could call a right approach. I don't think it's really right, but it's basically a recognition of the natural place of natural authority, natural hierarchies in life, the family, you know, natural civic leaders, business, church, um, intellectuals, leaders, all these things uh, are going to arise naturally, and that's a good thing. Um, so I think what happens is you have these libertarians who they just can't use Facebook like they want, and they get annoyed by it, just like the average person does. Now, when the average person gets annoyed by a business not giving them what they want, like you know, if a restaurant doesn't let blacks – doesn't serve blacks, they want to pass a law to fix it, you know, which they did in the 60s, right? forcing people to accept all comers, which is a violation of property rights. Um, and if Facebook – And then the argument of the mainstreamers has always been that if a business acts like it's a public thing, like a town square, or if it acts like it's open to the public, like a restaurant or a movie theater, then it it has to be held to the same kind of standards that we hold the government to. Now, why do we hold the government to these standards or the state? Well, we anarchists want the state abolished, but we're content – so we're also – in favor of limiting or restricting their power as much as we can. Minarchists and classical liberals favor the state, but they recognize that it has to come with limits. So we all favor limits on what the state can do, even if they're limits that would not apply to a private actor, right? So like Ayn Ayn Rand would say, like the government, the state has no right to, to hold an official position about what the right religion is. Right, not because a private individual doesn't have the right to have a, an opinion on religion, but because the state has a, a narrow, crucial, restricted role of enforcing law, and because it's the use of force, it has to be really limited in what it can do. Mm-hmm. Um, um, whereas, so if you start applying government restrictions to private actors, you're limiting them to things that they ought to have the right to do. You know, um, a, a private company ought to have the right to be racist or sexist or have religious preferences, whatever they want. Now, economically, we would say that they pay a price for that, right? I think they do. They tend to pay a price. Sometimes people are willing to pay the price. Uh, that's what the market supply and demand, the Hegel, you know, the negotiation between customer and supplier, employee and employers, social reprobation, approval, reputation, all this kind of stuff. Um, results in a certain type of market playing field. Um, so what I think is happening is these libertarians hate the left, which I, I do too, and I appreciate that. They see that the tech giants have become uh, ate up with dumbass, the dumb, as we say in the South, uh, ate up with the dumbass. Um, you know, they're a bunch of soft, dumb liberals, lefties. And they're using that to influence what their companies do. They're trying to push their narrative by, the, the economic and business pressure and social pressure that they have, basically by deplatforming people that say things they don't like. <clears throat> and we libertarians, some of us are saying, well, that's like taking my right to free speech because the, you know Facebook has become the town square. So they should be subject to the same regulations of a town, which is a government agency. So I think that's what they're doing. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to say basically – these companies have become so entangled with the state, either because the state is influencing them so much to pass – to enact state policies in a private sphere or vice versa. You know, the, uh, they're, they're getting their lefty progressive views put into place it by law because of their influence over the government, um, that the state intervention in the market is effectively – taking away the private status of these companies so we can treat them like public. But what does that mean? That means that there should be government-enforced laws 
that apply not only to the government itself, but apply to private actors. So you have this perverse thing of libertarians who oppose the state having laws which apply to the private sphere because it, it corrupts them and makes them not fully private, and then using that as an excuse to expand the state's domain and jurisdiction, allowing it to pass laws that limit not only government power like the Bill of Rights, but limit what these private companies can do. So I think the whole thing is misguided and perverse. Um, and, and, and not only that, I mean, we're never going to make progress towards a more private, less state society if we just seek to identify people and call them villains so that we can use force against them, either private force or a public force. That's not the way we progress towards a, a more libertarian society. Um, we sure should identify the way the state is making the private sphere less purely private and oppose that. So we should oppose the minimum wage. We should oppose tariffs. We should oppose government schools. We should oppose all manner of regulations and subsidies by the government that taint these private companies. But we shouldn't seek to vilify them and condemn them. We should oppose what they're lobbying for and oppose the state's involvement. And that's all I think that we can do with, with, with libertarian analysis. Yeah, um, I guess really what the important part is, is Facebook or Twitter, you know, um, committing aggression or helping in it, you know, um, even if you want to call it part of the state, uh, which, yeah, it's completely misguided. Are, you know, are they just receiving funding or are they just cooperating or are they committing aggression? You know, are they cooperating, trying to get the state, you know, give the state information, you know, to help commit aggression? Uh, I mean, if they're not doing either, uh, if they're not committing aggression, I just don't see why you would even want to classify them as part of the state. Well, honestly. and if they are committing aggression, they're either committing private aggression, which ought to be illegal and is illegal, and we oppose that. And we, and we libertarians, we actually do favor laws against aggression, whether they're private laws or even state laws, um, and or it's public aggression, which means they're doing it at the direction of the state or using the state's courts and apparatus to do it. But in any case, this is why it's good to be an anarchist. We have the solution is just shrinking the size of the state down as small as possible and basically to zero. Once you do that, that problem disappears. There is no possibility of a state forcing a company to act in a wrong way if the state doesn't exist, or of using state power to commit aggression against um, your 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 victims because the state doesn't exist. So all that's left is private aggression. And if there's private aggression, we can defend ourselves against that with, with private defense means in a private uh, law society. I know um, some have been like, yes, that's the libertarian answer, but we got to live in the real world. I know. Right, because they're – like I said, they're impatient. These yeah. guys are high time preference, impatient people, and they're willing to – some of them start compromising their principles. So they're willing to – so the 230 thing is a good example. Let's explain what that mm -hmm. is. So in the late – in the 1990s under Bill Clinton – Congress sort of half serendipitously passed um, two things that some argue helped keep the internet from being killed in its cradle by government regulation. And that was the, the – the, there's two safe harbors. One was a safe harbor basically from defamation liability. That was in Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, and the other was the, the safe harbor provisions – for copyright in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in 1996 and 98, I believe. And interestingly, the CDA was struck down as unconstitutional later, <laughs> I believe, except for the safe harbor. The Supreme Court let that stand, which is good. Um, so basically, it says that you know if you're a platform, um, internet, internet service provider was, I think, the term they used, which used to refer to like CompuServe and 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 GoDaddy and things like that. Yeah, it's and now. Um, yeah, go ahead. It's, that's the interactive computer service. That's what yeah. they said. So it means that if, if you have a service where your users can generate content, so they're using you as a platform, like they can put a website up or they can, or if you have a, if you have a, a website or a blog with comments, they can make a comment. Like you can make comments on YouTube videos now, and you can make comments on different news articles on websites. Then the, 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 the company hosting that and providing these these these, these third-party users the ability to post this information they would not be secondarily liable or vicariously liable for acts of defamation or acts of copyright infringement performed by these users because if they were they would have to police these comments to avoid liability 
or they'd have to just remove the comment section or the ability for people to create independent content with YouTube videos and websites and blogs. It would have stifled the whole way the internet works now. Yeah. Um, so when libertarians say, and so one of the arguments for the CDA thing was like, well, these, these platforms are not really editing and looking at what people do. They're not curating it, so they're not really the publisher like a newspaper is a publisher. Like if they publish an, uh, an editorial or, or, or a newspaper re report from their, one of their reporters and it, and, it, and it defames someone, then the newspaper can be sued because they're the publisher. Now, I actually think that's wrong too for two reasons. Um, well, the main reason is because defamation law is not libertarian, so I, there should be no defamation law. There should be no copyright law either. But um, uh, so one of the one of the uh, one of the observations was, well, the, these platforms, these internet service providers, are not acting like publishers. Now, that was not a condition of the safe harbor. It didn't say so long as you're not a publisher, you get the safe harbor. It just said, look, the internet's a new thing. We don't want to kill it in its in its cradle as it's emerging, so they don't have liability for for their users' comments. Now, the, the copyright thing wasn't as good of a safe harbor because it said you're not liable as long as you take down stuff when you're notified, which has led to this, this uh, the takedown thing where you know a million YouTube videos are taken down a month or something because yeah, it, ro robots tell them to, and they have to respond to avoid losing their safe harbor. Yeah, lately it's um, been affecting uh, Twitch pretty heavily with DMCA takedowns. Yeah, it's horrible, yeah. and there's there's very, very little liability if you file it maliciously or without substance or whatever because robots do it all the time. Sometimes robots of one company file it file these takedowns against the company's own YouTube stuff. I mean, it's, it's so ridiculous. But uh, and perversely, some libertarians and and conservatives and even liberals are arguing have been arguing for a while that Section 230 needs to be eliminated or radically scaled back. But that's because um, they think it protects big companies from liability when there's no distinction between like a publisher or a platform in that in Section 230. That, well, they think it's a government giving them a privilege, and mm -hmm. it's just like the, the libertarians who oppose corporations because they think that the limited liability grant gives them a privilege, and the state should not be granting privileges. And I agree with that, but these are just not privileges, and I can explain why. The reason they think they're privileges is because they're totally confused about… Um, about causation and liability for the limited liability issue, and also contract law, and they're also and they're confused about defamation and copyright law in the in the other issue, in the CDA issue, and the DMCA issue. Um, and um, um, I, I would say, to the contrary, instead of narrowing 230, what we should do is we should get rid of the DMCA copyright provisions and put them into 230. Or expand the DMCA provisions to be more like the Section 230 provisions. In other words, you should say that a, a, a publisher or not a publisher, a platform is not liable for copyright infringement of its users, but they don't have to take it down. They should not have to take it down um, uh, because that's not there for the CDA. You don't have to – if someone says, oh, one of your users posted a defamatory uh, comment on your, on your blog, you got to take that down or you'll lose your safe harbor. That, that's just not there. So the, I would actually broaden the DMCA copyright safe harbor to be more like the 230 rather than limit the 230. So the reason 230 should not be restricted, um, number one, even if – so some people say, well, they're acting like publishers now because they are, they, are, uh, they are curating content. They're deciding what to let on and what not to, which is true. I do believe that Twitter and Facebook are acting kind of like publishers to a degree now. But I don't think that should be an excuse to take away their 230 liability exemption for defamation. Uh, I think, if anything, I do agree it also makes a, uh, creates an unlevel playing field between traditional newspaper publishers and, uh, and um, these platforms, these internet platforms. And that was actually shown in a recent episode of the, of the Good Fight, which is the sequel to The Good Wife. Like I think one or two episodes ago, there was a, um, there was a, a, a plot about that. Um, but I think that the answer to an unlevel playing field is not to impose similar restrictions and to hobble B like A is being hobbled, is to unhobble A. So I would get rid of defamation altogether, certainly get rid of third party or vicarious li uh, secondary or vicarious liability of newspapers for, for def defamation of authors who publish in that newspaper. Um, so, you know, free them up too. Let's expand the CDA, <laughs> let's expand it to all print and all. all and television and everything. Yeah, and um, go ahead. Uh, 
it makes little sense. Well, first off, people are just wrong about Section uh, 230, but also it makes little sense for libertarians to even be talking about Section 230. Like, what does that have to do with libertarian principles whatsoever? You know, but I've seen libertarians. It's because they don't. It's because they don't. They don't all recognize that defamation should not be a tort at all. I've I've seen, I've seen some that are like anti IP that still confused on this, and um, I mean, yeah, it does go back into libel, which they need to read your paper on it, Uh, if they want to also read some Adolf Reinach, you know. But um, I know there's a great article uh you've mentioned it before uh, it's something like hello you've been referred here because you're wrong i forgot what it's about but it's about oh it's on dirt. it's on tech dirt it's mike masnick's site tech dirt they, ha- they have a page called um hello you're hello you're wrong about section 230 of the dmca and there's a list of, of frequently asked questions and answers showing why you're wrong because yeah. they're tired of answering the same stupid misunderstanding over and over again i've been building something like that for ip as hello you're wrong about intellectual property on the well, internet that, that article's awesome you yeah know, it has a ton of information um clears up a lot uh, by the way let me mention two things there's there's something i never thought of until recently about 230 i have been in favor of it um but I've always been a big proponent of federalism in the U.S. system as – well, for two reasons. Number one, it's a, it's, it's a sort of decentralist and a systematic and a structural way of limiting state power, especially federal power, which is the biggest one. And it's also in the Constitution, and not that I revere the Constitution, but, but it was an attempt to limit state power, and, and they need to be held to it, whatever it says – um, and and so because if they're not held to it, then th- that means that they're free to do whatever they want. Um, but um, the Section 230, I guess there is one problem with 230, and that is that I think it there's aspects of it that are unconstitutional because I think what it says is that states cannot hold you liable for defamation because um, this is a state law thing mostly. So. Like I guess I would say I would prefer if there was a Section 230 thing in every state. I don't know if the federal government really has the authority to to overturn state laws for defamation, even though they're unjust. And because they're unjust, I don't have too much heartburn over it. Sometimes I'm a results-oriented libertarian, and you know, the only reason I'm in favor of the Constitution and federalism is because they have instrumental value, like. They, yeah. they, it seems like they would happen to or tend to mostly push against violation of rights, but I'm also against any violation of rights. So, right. you know, if there's a Supreme Court decision that is not constitutional, but it ends up striking down an evil state law, I, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily violate anyone's rights. It just makes the government more dangerous by giving them more power and un- unleashing them from the tethers of the Constitution. So you have this tension sometimes. And then the other thing I want to say is – so Jeff Deist is one of the few people who has a – what I think a sincere and intelligent um, pushback against um, the kind of radical, legalistic, Rothbardian, Kinsella, Hoppy, and Block take on – defamation law and things like that. So I think like Deist has said in a couple of podcasts and maybe articles that um, maybe like Rothbard's article against defamation and the ethics of liberty, I think it's called knowledge, true and false, maybe chapter 10. I can't remember the chapter, but um, knowledge, true and false, you know, where he says like, you don't own your reputation because that would be owning what other people think about you. So all defamation law is wrong. You, no one owns their reputation basically. Um <clears throat> So all defamation law is unjust and should fall, uh, even though it's state-based and even though it arose on the common law. It's not even legislation-based always. Um, and so Dice points out that today's day and age is different. Just like we, the Austrian economists of 50 years ago never thought of digital money, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and we might have to revise our application of economics to this new phenomenon. Uh, I mean, Dice is saying that look, we never imagined a world where you know, a company, a private, a so-called private company like Twitter or Facebook could just take a decision, um, or not only that, someone could post something about you, like saying uh, you're a child molester, and you're just basically deplatformed everywhere from your employer, you know, from loans, from supermarkets, from 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 your from your domain provider, from credit card processing. Um, so it could basically ruin your whole life. 
So he's saying that the magnitude of harm is so much so that we might need to let common law judges decide this and apply these old principles to the new world of technology. I still have a problem with that intellectually because it's still missing the point that um, he's right that it can cause a lot of damage or harm, and it can cause magnitudes more harm and damage maybe now today than it could in in, in the past. Um, but the standard for libertarians is never harm; it's aggression. So we have to choose: is it is it is it harm or aggression that we oppose? Because you have the right to harm people. Mm-hmm. As long as you do it by legitimate means. So if I compete with you and I steal your customers, I'm harming you. If I steal your girlfriend, I'm harming you. But it's all peaceful and not aggressive, so it's legitimate. Yeah, I mean, um, Abba covered that with um, you don't have a right in value. You know, like if your house goes down in property value because of someone else's house, you know, oh well, you know, you don't have a right against that person to stop them. Uh, and exactly. It's pretty much the same with. Um, I guess with Dice's argument is that it goes back to if it's not about defamation and like reputation is on one's head or mind, then it would go back to value or um, kind of a right to future profits. Correct. You yeah. So, so so the problem I have with Dice is that he, I think he's correct that the magnitude of damage is is potentially far greater now, mm-hmm. but it but the standard cannot be harm. It's got to be aggression. Do you violate the? And this is what Hoppe says. And I'll, I'll link to all these in the show notes. That's what Hoppe says. Um, um, do you did you violate the physical integrity of someone's property? Now there are some continuum or gray areas, or maybe difficult areas, which I touch on in my causation piece. Um, so, for example, if you let's suppose you're uh, let's suppose you falsely accuse someone of a crime, and that ends up causing them to go to prison unjustly. Now you can blame the jury system, you can blame blame the law, you can blame the you can blame the jurors, you can blame the judge, you can blame the jailer, but I think you also could blame the person lying and causing it to happen. So it is a speech act, but in that case, the speech act was designed to and ended up causing physical harm. Like there's a physical violation of the person's bodily integrity. Um, they played a causal role. They played a causal role, but they played a causal role not in harm. They played a causal role in a rights violation, so that's mm-hmm. the difference. Um, that you can make the same argument about, like, um, see, this is where I would disagree with Rothbard. Rothbard says that incitement is never a crime. Like, if you incite a mob to go after some guy, and they hang, they they lynch the guy, it's the mob's fault, but it's not your fault because you just spoke words. I think that's totally wrong. Um, um, it, it, given the context, your words can be causal. They can be a causal factor in the harm or in the rights violation that occurred. I mean, yeah. just imagine, you know, Truman ordering the dropping of bombs over Hiroshima um, in Nagasaki, or imagine, um, you know, a firing squad commander saying, "Ready, aim, fire." All he does is speak. You know, I mean, these libertarians that are so myopic and they think that only the actual soldier or whatever is liable, uh, only the underling is liable, not the mafia boss who ordered him to commit a hit. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, well, it goes back to the free will. You know, but Correct. the problem is you have to look at it like what you point out in your piece in a praxeological uh, kind of framework, and it's just means and ends. Correct. And you can use other can people. Means. You can use another person as a means. That's what cooperation is. We we recognize there's cooperation for good things, like for economic cooperation, but there's also cooperation for bad things. That's what conspiracies are. You know, <laughs> not the nutty libertarian tinfoil hat, uh, no moon landing conspiracies, but. Or, or, um, or the vaccine has microchips in it, conspiracies, <laughs> but, um, but a, a criminal conspiracy, which means people combine together to cooperate to do something. So if you have a bank robber, you have a guy that plans it, you have the getaway car driver, maybe the guy who funded it, and then you have the guys that walk into the bank with the shotguns. So some, some, uh, some myopic libertarians say only, only the guys with the shotguns are liable, and in fact, each one's only, only liable for what he did. Like there's no uh, felony murder rule, which which is the rule that like say two guys go into a bank with a shotgun each, or w- let's say one of them has a shotgun. Only one has a shotgun. The other guy's not armed, and they rob the place. And then during the robbery, the guy with the shotgun kills an innocent person. Well, under the felony murder doctrine, both of them are liable for that, which I think is co- completely correct. But you know the the, the kind of the 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 the, the 
the nitpicky libertarian would say, no, it's only the guy with the shotgun. Fuck, I don't know why they don't just blame the shotgun itself. Why do they blame the guy, you know? Right. He, he wasn't the pellets flying through the air that went into the body. I mean, these guys have no – I think their, their mistake is that they have a mechanistic and a, and, a, and, a, and a legally ignorant view of the way things work, a mechanistic view of things. They falsely believe that if you give responsibility to the, to the other guy or to the guy higher up the chain, like the, the general or the mm-hmm. president or the mafia boss – or the bank robbery planner, if you give them responsibility, like they think there's a fixed pie of responsibility, like 100%. And if you give 10%, 50%, 90% to the, to the planner, then that, that has less left over for the, for the actual guy who committed it. Right, when there's okay. enough responsibility to go around. Yeah, you can have. They don't even know the concept of joint and several liability, which means they're both 100 percent liable. They, that blows their minds because they're not lawyers. They've never heard of this. I mean, this is a common concept over the well, centuries. It's not that difficult. Know about Rothbard strict causal liability? Or I forgot what the name of specific what it was. You know where he's a bit too narrow. Oh, strict, li- uh, strict liability? Strict liability, yeah. Wasn't that in his like air pollution? And- I It might have been, I, and that's one thing I haven't worked on too much. I would like to someday because I think libertarians have a uh, – well, there's an underdeveloped, underdeveloped theory of strict strict liability, um, and I think it's got a lot of uh, flaws in it. Um, mm-hmm. uh, they take for granted some aspects of strict liability law as it's developed, which I think is wrong. Um, tort law is all messed up. Um, so – you know, they seem to think. I think their their fundamental mistake is they think that uh, they think that liability comes from ownership right, instead no. of instead of action. That's their mistake, and I've identified this in a couple of long blog posts. Um, but liability, and they'll they'll do this kind of Republican thing where you know Republicans say, "Well, we have rights, but rights come with responsibilities." You know, <laughs> so libertarians buy into this crap too. They'll say, "Well." If they do it implicitly, they'll say if you own property, then you're responsible for someone being harmed by it. It's like, wait, that actually is not true. Ownership is the right. It's not a responsibility. It's not a responsibility at all. You're not responsible for your property. That's stupid. Your responsibility for your you're responsible for your actions because actions is what harms other people or what violates their property rights. Um, so for example, if I if I shoot you with a gun. I'm liable because I shot you with a gun, not because I own the gun. Right. Like if, if that was the case, I, I could just avoid responsibility by stealing someone else's gun, and then I could shoot as many people as I want because I don't own the gun. It's ridiculous. Um, and likewise, if someone steals my gun and they shoot someone with it, I shouldn't be responsible. After all, it's my gun. Right, but you didn't commit the aggression. Right. So ownership of, 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 the, of the means used to commit aggression is irrelevant in, in the – analysis of responsibility it's all about it's all about action and for action we just simply need to identify the structure of that actor's action and what means he employed what was his goal and was he successful (laughs) um it's got nothing to do with ownership um because you got to remember means is an economic concept it's not a juristic concept it's a descriptive concept not a prescriptive context concept means means some Something in the world that can be physically or actually employed by a human actor to causally interfere in the world to, to achieve a result. This is all descriptive. It's all economic. It's all things that could happen on a desert island. It has nothing to do with law, justice, norms, property whatsoever. It's got to do with control and possession and the ability to manipulate and handle. So that's what means are. And so responsibility legally for an action. Flows from your committing, you're your, your, uh, taking an action that employs certain means that did causally, efficaciously cause someone else's body or, or resources that they own to be invaded. So this is the mistake people make, and I, I, I don't blame them for this because this area is, is confusing and hasn't so far been developed very far but honestly, we do we do need to do that we do need to d- distinguish between economic concepts and juristic or normative concepts yeah um really the most work that's been done is just your piece you know um I've, i mean unless i'm just missing on a major article or something uh, that's the best piece i know about and one of the pretty much the only one that essentially gets it right when it comes to liability 
you know, and it's a lot to untangle, but um, really just thank God for, I guess, Adolf Reinach, you know. I, I agree. And uh, I mean, the guy, th that guy, this is Adolf Reinach, uh, who was a great, I think he's phenomenologist, kind of a Kantian type um, legal philosopher in, I guess he was German, right? Or, or think, Austrian, Austrian, German, Austrian, Prussian, I think, so. but he died in World War One, I, I think. He died in World War One at a very early age, and uh, he had, I don't think he was 40 yet. He had already written a lot of great things, and it's a shame. Well, of course, it's a shame he died, but yeah. But no, no telling what the guy would have produced if he had lived longer. But um, yeah, I think – and my work is not comprehensive and complete. It's more of a sketch towards a theory, but the only reason mine is solid is because I carefully built upon other foundations. But I think the reason the other work is sort of unsatisfying – is number one, well, libertarianism is really relatively new. Not so far, not a lot of areas have been dealt with in detail. We just defer to the mainstream thinkers on this stuff. And they're, of course, not going to be informed by Austrian economics and, and by careful libertarian analysis. So they might be good scholars in their little narrow field, like legal scholars or whatever, but they're going to, they're always going to miss something when they come to normative thinking because they're not libertarians. And by contrast, a lot of libertarians are really not sophisticated. And deeply mired in legal theory, so they don't have a lot of tools to bring those things in when they develop the libertarian take on things. Um, right. In fact, that's it's been you, so. Yeah, go ahead. That's why you were able to pretty much demolish IP because you I think actually so. knew about. I it. think so. Um, um, it's because we have a small. We're a small group, so there's only so many people that have the right intersections of knowledge. Um, like in my case of. Knowing Austrian economics and praxeology, especially uh, Rothbard and Hoppe's radical politics and Hoppe's property theory. Um, but really, your estoppel theory. Yeah, which is borrows upon Hoppe's and um, argumentation ethics, and uh, and also just knowing knowing the the law and the way it works, which you have to basically know at a certain point to understand strict liability, to understand the way causation has been applied in the law and intellectual, what intellectual property is. Because um, these things are arcane and, and detailed. So you have to have people that know all that. And there's a few of us growing out there, but even the ones that are pretty good, like Randy Barnett's great, but mm -hmm. he has a different approach to a lot of things. Um, um, but he's made he's made some lots of contributions too. But there's not a lot of us out there. Um, hopefully in the future, you know, we'll we'll keep growing and people will yeah. learn about build on our works and there'll be more progress made in, in the upcoming decades on like I said, strict liability, um, even like even the area of – you'll hear people always are get confused about restrictive covenants um, mm -hmm. and things like trusts. And the positive law, the common law has one way of approaching that, but it's really legalistic, and it's just what the law is. And li some libertarians just reject things out of hand that they don't understand because they're not lawyers. Um, and they're actually kind of right to be suspicious and skeptical. But – and some of them say, well, you could never have restrictive covenant because – the way they the way they have a crude understanding of what property rights and contracts are, but I think I could I could explain why restrictive covenants are perfectly legitimate, and lawyers would be able to craft a clever document to create one. Mm -hmm. um, and I can explain how, but it just takes a while. And I haven't written on it much, but I want to do that too. That's another thing on my list to to to, to explain why restrictive covenants work. I mean, at worst, I mean, even by their logic, at worst, it could be just hey, you do this. Um, you transfer ownership of X amount of money, you know, or you do this, you lose your rights to your home, you know. And I mean, I don't, I don't know. I've seen many libertarians be against HOAs, but they almost act as if they're many states. And maybe, well, in yes. And, and part of the reason, again, is this is this sort of anti authoritarian thing. It's just, they just don't like being told what to do. Mm -hmm. But the answer is, well, then don't, don't own a piece of property and give parts of your rights away to your neighbors. Right. You know, it's like don't go into don't go into business with other people if you don't if you don't want you know if you don't want co-owners don't have a co-owner, but if you do don't whine about it. Yeah. Um, the only thing, well, I mean, I guess with HOA, um, is the whole co-ownership thing because then I don't know. Uh, it kind of for me it seems too similar to Rothbard's um, right. You know, literally copyright. You know, the common law. Of, well, you don't have the right in this book to copy, kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it seems super similar, and that's why I'm. I mean, maybe. Okay. Well, let's you know, go into that. So, the mistake Rothbard made there was he said, well, first of all, he 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 leaned upon this this legal doctrine of the bundle of rights, which I've always found to be unhelpful. It's it's the way of saying that well, if you own a right 
And the common law is really messy because of the, the roots in feudalism. Like so in the in the civil law, you just say you own a piece of you own a piece of land. You're the owner. That's it. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the common law, it's all these terms like fee simple and it's sort of feudalistic based, you know. Um, but um, um, what were we just talking about? I had a brain fart. Oh, um, talking about the co- like Rothbard's common law copyright and then, oh yeah, um, yeah. So what Rothbard says that he goes, he goes. So you and Rothbard. It's strange that Rothbard messed this up because he he's the one who pioneered a brand new thinking of, of what contract should be. Instead of being binding promises, which is how the law conceives of it, um, which then which then they have to fix undesirable implications of it, like specific performance and voluntary slavery. They have to fix that with a patch. And Rothbard even does that. He fixes his own wrong interpolations of his own contract theory with his own patch. Like he says, debtors, debtors prison wouldn't is possible, but wouldn't be just in most cases because it would be disproportionate punishment, which is a patch. It's not true. Mm-hmm. Um, but Rothbard's contract theory views contract as just the exercise by an owner of a resource, um, the alienation of title to it to someone else. It's a transfer of title. Um, and so in that theory, you can have like a contract between people doesn't need to be complete. It could be partial. Like, you know, I can loan my car to you for a week instead of forever, instead of giving it, selling it to you or giving it to you. Or I can loan you my car or we can, we can co-own an apartment and I get to use it um, on even numbered months and you get to use it on odd numbered months. So we're co-owners. We split it up that way. Right. So you can have a contract between you which shows what co-ownership means. Uh, so that's the bundle of rights ideas. You can divide rights up in different ways by clever contracting. Now, in the law, there's a there's there's some dispute about whether these divisions are contract between the people or whether they're called real rights. They're, they're ownership rights. But that's another legal thing that you need to be aware of to, to make progress on these doctrines. You know, Like oil and gas leases are considered leases in some states and considered property rights in other states. Different ways of looking at it, but they have different results sometimes, depending on how you classify things. But in any case, what Rothbard says is that if you have a contract, if you sell someone a book and you have a contract – or a mou- I think a mousetrap example. You sell someone a mousetrap, and the condition is you can't copy this mousetrap. Then the way he envisions it is because there's a bundle of rights. I'm only giving the buyer partial ownership of the mousetrap. I'm reserving the right to copy. So he has this mousetrap with, a, with it's missing the right to copy. So if he sells it to someone else, they don't have the right to copy it either because they don't have a mousetrap with this right to copy built into it. But that's sort of an overextension of this bundle of rights idea. I mean, the right to copy was never part of the bundle of rights. The right, right to copy is, is the implication of the libertarian non-aggression principle, which basically implies that you can do any action you want in the world as long as it doesn't commit aggression against someone else right, or trespass. So the right to copy just means to use information that you have. If you acquire the information – then you can use it. That's it. So if you have information and you make it public, then other people can use it. And, yeah. and when they use that information, they don't violate anyone's rights. So if I sell a mousetrap and 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 the public aspect of the mousetrap that people can see reveals some kind of new feature or new design, then they're going to learn. So I'm basically by selling the mousetrap, I'm teaching everyone. I'm publicizing information. So then you can't you can't whine about it. So Rothbard goes off track there. Uh, now, restrictive covenants are different because – so Rothbard is trying to talk about information. Information is never and cannot be the subject of property. Rothbard almost recognizes this because he says that he, – he has the key insight that all rights are property rights. But because his writing didn't stick as closely to the idea of scarcity, scarce means as Mises and Hoppe did, he sort of lost sight of the importance of action involving scarce resources or scarce means. So that when he said all rights are property, all human rights are – all rights are human rights, and all human rights are property rights, he, he should have then emphasized the next thing, which is – and all property rights are rights of control over scarce resources. Right? That's what they are. Yeah. Uh, you literally cannot have a property right in information. Information is another feature of human action. So human action has scarce means. So this is what Mises, his Kantian proxyological framework, or his proxyological framework, and Hoppe. They keep emphasizing praxeology. Humans employ means to achieve ends, but they do it 
with access to knowledge or information that guides their actions. So you have two things that are crucial about successful action. Number one, you have availability of a means that you can employ. And number two, you have knowledge that guides what you do. Those are two different things, and the means are scarce, and that's why property rights make sense for those, right? So yep. property rights never can apply to information. They only apply to means because property rights are enforced by force, and force is a physical thing that only applies to the physical means in the world, the things that causally interfere. I mean, that's, that's how this all works. Rothbard, right. loses, I think he lost sight of that because he didn't emphasize scarcity and means so much in praxeology and his writing. So he lost sight of that when he said that um, – um, when he said all property, all human rights are property rights, but he forgot to realize that that's only property rights in scarce means. Right. So then he started thinking, well, there can be property rights in knowledge too, because knowledge of the design of a thing is part of the bundle of rights. And that's where he made that mistake. I guess uh, the reason why I was thinking of the comparison between HOA and that, which now I understand why it's not connected to HOA, was because of the idea of like co ownership. Correct. Which I've always been pretty skeptical i mean i right. know that you can make arrangements and like let's say if you co-own i don't know a timeshare with somebody else uh sure i can easy to say okay you two have a better claim to it or better better reason to be able to exclude others from using it than some third party but the it just seemed like i had a problem or i still have a problem with right. ownership just because it seems like there can be conflict yes. unless you just have some already pre-made conflict resolution kind of deal it just seems like Considering only one person can own something, you know, yeah. necessarily, it just seems kind of yeah. And Hoppe sort of in in some of his property right, he kind of implies there can only be one owner, um, but like it has to be indivisible. But if you just imagine a marriage, you know, a husband and wife, they're in a sense co-owners of their property. Um, as far as dispute resolution issues uh, or even amendments to the agreement, those either are specified explicitly. Mm-hmm. Or if they're not, then the presumption, the way the law works in the common in the common law, and the way it should work, I think, in private libertarian law, is that there's a default assumption. There's default assumptions or gap fillers or what we call suppletive terms. So, uh, and and so you, if in the absence of a st- stated condition, all the all the dispute resolver can do, like the arbitral arbitral tribunal, the judge, the jurors, whatever, all they can do is try to guess at what the parties intended. And if right. they have to take a guess that you say is wrong, that's the fault of the parties for not being explicit. So when they're not explicit, it's because they're lazy or they don't want to spend resources papering it, or they don't really care. They, they figure that whatever's reasonable, whatever the jury would determine using what they try to resolve using reasonable standards, they're fine with the outcome, which is basically the way I would look at it. Right. Um, so um, and in the law… I think the law, the positive law now would have different ways of of looking at co-ownership. I think in some jurisdictions, they would look at it. Now, they don't care too much because the courts enforce whatever they say, so they get the results. But I think some scholars would say, well, a co-ownership situation is where A and B both co-own something, like a husband and wife both co-own a house. Mm -hmm. And what that – another way to look at it would be that one of them owns it, but the other one has a contract right. So – and whether that makes a difference or not is is hard to see. I, I've never devoted a lot of time to that because it's premature. I think that maybe the way the positive law looks at it would be the way that private libertarian legal scholars would look at it after the libertarian law has been developed. But it's premature to guess because right. we would need to first develop the private libertarian law mostly along the current lines, but then see the West would classify. My, my personal leaning is that um, – the way it is 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 it's like imagine a sale. A owns uh, a car and sells it to B. Now, why does B own the car now? B owns the car. The way I would say it is this: um, the sale, as I characterize in my contract article, is not a binding promise, but it's an alienation of title. And the reason the alienation of title works is it's effectively an abandonment by the owner. And then a rehomesteading by the buyer. Mm-hmm. So it's an abandonment arranged in a way to put the, the buyer in position to it's like throwing a, it's like throwing a football pass. You're throwing it at the receiver and you design it so that only he catches it, you know. So I I we arrange it so that the, the buyer is in position to rehomestead it by either letting him have possession of it or some other some other technique. Okay. But um, um 
Um, so why does B own it? To own something is not a contract right. It's an in rem right. It's a real right, good against the world. That means that someone can't take my car without my permission, not because I have a contract with them, but because it's mine. Right? right. So I don't need to go around having a contract with all 8 billion people on the earth to agree not to take my car. It's my car because there's only one car and I have the best connection to it. But in property theory and libertarian theory, the best connection is the first user, the homesteader. Okay. Now I'm assuming this guy found the found the materials for the car. The first guy found the materials for the car himself in the state of nature, made the car himself. That's unrealistic, but let's assume he's the first first possessor of the car. So he's the owner of it. Well. Right. A is still the first possessor of the car, so why doesn't he have a better claim than B? And the answer is because he abandoned it in favor of B. But so from the rest of the from the rest of the from CDE's point of view, A owns the car because he has the better claim to it because he owned it first. Mm -hmm. But I should have picked an apple or something as a better example, <laughs> something you find in the state of nature. But anyway, um, um, but B has a better claim than everyone else because. He stands – it's like subrogation in insurance law. He stands in, in A's place because basically he can he can make A's claim. To, if C challenges B for the car, B can say, well, A has a better claim than you, and I have a better claim than A because A gave it to me. Right. So, so it's sort of like a blending of contract and property law. Property law would be A's claim because of first homesteading or homesteading, and B's claim would be based on contract, which is which is a, which is a, an application of, of ownership. It's what the owner A did. Um, so, in a sense, from the rest of the world, A and B are co-owners of that car because, as a unit, A plus B together have a better claim than anyone else in the world. Mm -hmm. But as between A and B, B can defeat A's claim because. Be, a would be a stopped from claiming ownership of the car. That's why my estoppel theory would come in. Okay, so I think of co-ownership as similar to that situation. So if a husband and wife or two business partners own a building, then to the rest of the world, you can look at A and B as a unit. Mm -hmm. Like they're not really a corporation, but they're just as a as a as a, as a pairing. A plus B together have a better claim than C, D, and E. So basically, for the rest of the world excluded. Now, as between A and B. Their usage of that depends upon their private contract with each other. So if, if we have a timeshare and, and 10 people own this timeshare condominium in Florida, um, then there's a, there's a contract between them that they've all signed, which is not binding on the rest of the world. For the rest of the world, these 10 owners own it, and the rest of the world can't use the condo because they, they're not part of this agreement. But as between those 10 owners, they have a contract saying, well, there's a decision-making unit like a board. Which is appointed according to the following rules, and then the owners get to vote on the board constitution. You know, sort of like a corporation, like board of directors, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, and then it, it might even have provisions saying, okay, the 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 shareholders agreement or the co ownership agreement over this condo is written down on this piece of paper, and it might have a clause saying, and it can be amended the following procedure, like it can be amended if two thirds of the owners vote to amend it. You know, you could have right. things like that in there. And if you don't have it, or if there's a cloudy provision, or or then if these if these guys have a dispute between each other, they have there's probably a dispute clause in there saying if we have a dispute, it has to be settled by arbitration. The arbitrator's got to try to do the best he can given the given the given the ink spot. Yes, what Bork called the Ninth Amendment. You know, is the Ninth Amendment meant nothing to him. He said it's as if there was an ink an ink spot on the someone had spilled their ink over Article Nine of the Bill of Rights and. And a judge is trying to interpret it, but there's an ink spot over. It. He can't read what it says, so he 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 can't. He doesn't know what to enforce. You know, <laughs> private judges or arbitrators are in that position. If if the parties were too lazy or incompetent or cheap or impatient or whatever to include a provision addressing the the situation that came up, and it's right. it's basically impossible to have a comprehensive contract because the. The world is uncertain. The future is uncertain. There will always necessarily be things that come up that were not contemplated, which, by the way, is why I think the whole idea of smart contracts is a complete bullshit. This Bitcoin idea, this Electrum, the Ethereum idea of smart contracts, I think makes no sense whatsoever. But that's me. I'm a crank on that issue. Um, yeah, I guess anyway. my, Go my ahead. biggest thing was um, with co ownership wasn't so much against the world, but just the co owners. Just Correct. Because, you know, the purpose slash function i don't know i don't like either of those words for it of you know rights is just um avoiding uh interpersonal conflict so you know if you can 
you could imagine just a husband and a wife disagreeing on what temperature to set it on, you know, and you do have a conflict where one's swatting away the other's hand, you know, it's kind of like, yes, Correct. it's small. Yes. It's hard to do is from an armchair, but, uh, and you need more context, blah, blah, blah. But it just seemed like if we're going to have a comprehensive um, and consistent rights theory, then it seems like, I don't know, but to me, it, it would, it, you would need something that could at least guide. Yeah. That, but I know? think the, the way the law has dealt with these things is the right way to do it. So basically if the husband and wife can't decide what to do with the thermostat, mm -hmm. then if, from the rest of the world's point of view, the husband and wife own this home. It's none of the rest of the world's business how they do it. Mm -hmm. Now, the husband and wife have, this, have a dispute with each other. Now, they're supposed to be married and cooperative, so they're supposed to figure it out between themselves. But if they can't, then basically they have to get a divorce, and then mm -hmm. the assets have to be split up. The same thing happens when like someone dies and they leave a big estate. Like let's say they leave the family mansion to to three three different heirs, three children. Now, if the three kids can't decide what to do with the house, like they, they could decide. all use the house together, mm -hmm. but if they can't decide, like if only one person disagrees, they can force a sale. Yeah. So then you sell the house at the highest price at an auction, unless if they can't agree on how to do it, they have to sell it at an auction, and then the money's split up according to the wills pro rata, uh, you know. Um, um, uh, the, the the testaments uh, division of assets. So, if if co owners can't agree, then they have to they have to split it up. Usually, according to the provision in the agreement in the first place. But there's ways of handling these things. Mm -hmm. I feel. I mean, I definitely see. I guess I'm more convinced that co ownership's a possibility, um, though it does feel like something that has not been written on that much. It hasn't, and so that's why, and it hasn't because. Most libertarians, again, are not deeply familiar with the way the positive law has dealt with this, so they don't know what to Where borrow to from and critique and adjust and tweak or even just adopt wholesale. Um, or, they, they or, or, or they adopt it wholesale without thinking about it. You can't just adopt it wholesale. They do this all the time. They'll, they'll just say, well, the law says this, and it's like, well, that's what the positive law says, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the right libertarian result. Right. Well, many try to reinvent, uh, reinvent the will. You know, many that especially newer, I'm gonna be honest, especially newer libertarians seem like they want to reinvent the will, don't want to read, they just want to correct, you know. But, and I, um, I think sometimes we're forced to reinvent the wheel to some degree, but we have to mm -hmm. do it cautiously, humbly, and preferably as armed as possible with knowledge of all the other things, so that you're you don't do it, you do it to the bare minimum amount amount necessary. Right. Um uh, but I think you're right that the ultimate purpose of property rights is it's a practical social institution designed to permit cooperation and conflict to be avoided to permit cooperation and to permit conflict to be avoided and so i think probably the, the best way to look at it is if there's a co-ownership situation what that means is that um for the rest of the world these these co-owners are the owner but as between themselves they have a contract and that contract specifies um how the thing is used so that they can use it without conflict. I mean, look, if you take someone on a ride in your car and they're a passenger, then you're giving them the right to use the car for certain purposes, but not – and you retain most of the rights on that car. It's a division of rights. It's temporary, but that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. Or if you lease the car, if Avis rents me a car, hires – if I hire a car, as the Brits would say, um, I have the usage rights over that car, which technically is a property right. Mm -hmm. It's the right to use the car. But it's a limited right. You know, they retain the right, the full rights of the car when the when the, re when the when the rental period expires. And while I'm using it, I only have partial rights over it. Even then, I can't use, I can't smoke in it, I can't drive it to Canada, I can't blow it up. You know, I can't repaint it. Um, I mean, so, I've heard. Yeah, go ahead. I've heard you say this uh, similar things before, but I guess I don't know why right now it's more clicking together. Um, co ownership. I mean. I know you've said that stuff like 10 times in different episodes because it seems like in your episodes you go over the same things over and over again, you know, which it's generally the fundamentals, though. Um, but well, uh, like in Louisiana, in the civil law, there's an interesting legal expression uh, like a husband and wife are said to, well, there's community property. So everything that husband and wife either one acquires during their marriage is community property, and they're said to co own that. In in division, okay. So that's an interesting concept. In in division, which means it's not divided. Which means 
that's my conception of from the rest of the world's point of view, it's a one piece of property that's a hundred percent owned completely by those two people. Mm-hmm. So, but and as between those two, how they govern it is up to them to to agree upon or disagree or compromise or whatever. And if they can't, then they have to get a divorce and then it's divided, right? Mm-hmm. Then it's not owned in, in division anymore because it's not indivisible. It's been divided now, which means you take the asset, you sell it, and you split you split up the proceeds. Half the cash goes to one, half to the other, and then they go their own ways. Right. But so long as it's co-owned, it's owned in indivision, which simply means that the rest of the world sees it as an owned unit by this group of people, which is how corp- corporations, I think, would work too, to be honest. Um, um, but anyway. I think well, I, mean, I think we should clo- let's fight it. let's finish up what you want to ask now. Yeah. Then I need, let's close it out, and we can we can do another session later if you have more. Um, but go ahead. Um, I guess to finish it up, just um, with Facebook and Twitter and all that being you know going back to the first thing, being part of the state. The big thing is even if they're cooperating or being funded by it, the main thing is uh, are they helping commit aggression or are they committing aggression? And really calling it Facebook as a part of the state gets into dangerous grounds of opening up for legislation. Yeah, I would say if if they're committing aggression, we should oppose that. We should we should condemn it, uh, and we should oppose whatever makes that possible, which is usually the state. So we mm-hmm. should oppose the state forcing them to commit aggression, or or regulating so much that it's inevitable, or, and we should oppose oppose the state being usable as a means for these corporations to commit aggression. Like like for example, if Facebook uses its patents, or not Facebook, like let's say Apple. Apple or, or Google or, or Motorola or the, you know if they use their or if they use their patent or, or Microsoft um, if they use their patents to, to stop competition they're using the state's force in that case you can blame the state too because the, the state handed out these so the state's intervening in the market but then you have private companies using state force against their against innocent parties right same thing with antitrust law you can bring an antitrust lawsuit in civil courts against your against someone who you think is a bad guy right. um so and defamation defamation suits too copyright copyright infringement so but we already oppose those laws as libertarians so the reason that these these corporate corporations are committing aggression is because they're employing the 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 illegal arms of the state in a sense you know mm-hmm. um but the solution is not to say well the state's laws should be aimed not only at the state and it's some private actors, but it should be aimed also at these extra private actors because that's expanding the scope of the state and the power of the state. Right. Very dangerous. But um, I mean, that's all I've got. Thank for this um, one. And thank you for, you know, allowing me to be on. Uh, yeah. I mean, I would, I guess, like to do another one at some other time, you know, but it would be more inside baseball versus just okay. this anything, is more, I feel like general. anything's fine with me. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Nick.